Good morning. I'm really surprised there are this many people here for a crypto talk in the morning. Um, so uh, this talk is uh, Tales from the Crypt, a cryptography primer, and uh, I'm actually with iOvation now. We recently got purchased. And then I guess I wasn't updated, but that's fine. Um, about a really quick, like, 30 seconds on who I am. So I'm a senior engineer at iOvation. I'm an IoT enthusiast. Actually, last year I gave a talk on IoT security. And I am an NJB Division I girls basketball coach, which is my passion. <laughs> uh, so what are we going to discuss here for the next little bit? Uh, we're going to talk about common methods and terms used for cryptography and application development. Uh, there's a lot more stuff that goes on with cryptography, but we've only got 15 minutes, <laughs> so I can only talk about so much. Uh, and please don't dwell, if you're like me, when I started working at uh, LaunchKey slash Iovation, I thought I understood crypto, and then I found out I knew, I didn't know what I didn't know, and I knew way less than I thought, and I didn't understand it the way that I thought I did. If you find yourself in the same position after this talk, going, wow, we're doing that completely wrong, don't feel bad about it, everybody does it, just move on, all right? Fix it moving forward. So if you don't know, and if you're a complete noob, which is perfectly okay, um, cryptography is the practice and study of techniques for secure communication in the presence of third parties called adversaries. That's a great definition out of, uh, um, out of Wikipedia, but what does it really mean? Is it basically cryptography is obscuring data in a way that's difficult and costly to duplicate or reverse. So application development, that is the real world use. You're trying to make it very hard for people to decrypt your data and recreate passwords. So, Good cryptography has a high level of entropy. That's a great buzzword in the crypto world, entropy. Uh, but what it really means is that encrypted or hashed data has a low level of predictability. Um, so you're trying to reduce patterns. But all data has patterns, and that's why entropy is important. So if you're talking about passwords, all right, there's this thing called the top 100 passwords. And those top 100 passwords comprise about 10% of everyone's passwords. Right? Password one, I hate passwords. Right? Whichever ones you add, tell them that you, they can't use, they go find other ones. Um, and so you have common data, right? You'll have common dates that people use for birth dates, things like that. What you're trying to do is you're trying to make those pieces not look the same. Um, and when you remove those patterns, what you're doing is you're increasing the difficulty uh, and making it more costly to reverse. So if you've got patterns in your data, it's less costly. It's easier for hackers to figure out what you're doing. So here's a great example of poor entropy. We actually have a poster of this up in our office. So this is uh, Tux, everybody's favorite Linux penguin. And this is what has been considered good cryptography for a long time. This is AES with uh, EBC. So electronic uh, cookbook, sorry, ECB, not EBC, ECB. And electronic cookbook does not have uh, really good entropy because as you can see, the encrypted data has a very distinct pattern. Uh, it looks just like the old one. And everywhere that was white has the same value on the, new, on the new value. Everywhere that was black has the same value. So in this particular uh, type of encryption with poor entropy, you don't have to solve every piece. You just have to solve one of the black pieces, and you've got all of them. You have to solve one of the white pieces, you've got all of them. Uh, and then once you get most of your data, you can kind of munge the rest and figure it out. So ways that you can increase entropy is mixing in, this is a great phrase, cryptographically secure pseudo-random data. Uh, that's a great big term. Pseudo-random is something you'll hear a lot um, because it's not actually random. It just kind of looks random uh, in the form of an initialization vector or salt. So if you've been using crypto and you're wondering what this IV is for, the initialization vector is to um, should be random, and that will increase your entropy. So that if you have the same value, if you have the same password one in your, in your password hashes, the values that come out are going to be different, which is important. That's the important part. Uh, and also, you can increase entropy with feedback loops. So when you're doing passwords, you should be doing key derivation. Um, or if you're doing encryption, you should be placing part or all of the encrypted data back into the next packet to be encrypted so that that creates more randomness as you go along. So here's an example of a really good feedback loop. Um, and this is for uh, AES encryption using a Cypher blockchain. So Cypher blockchain is kind of the, the standard for doing block-based encryption. 
And if you take a look at what it's doing, it's, it's basically you take your initialization vector because that's where you have to start, and hopefully that's random. Um, and you're mixing it with your plain text for that particular block. You're putting on your encryption cipher against it. And you're getting your cipher text. And that cipher text is now the initialization vector for the next set. And what that's doing is that's creating entropy because on the first example, you saw that every time you encrypted white, it came out to the same value. Well, this time, every time you encrypt white, it's going to have a different value because the encrypted value of the previous one is now being used in the next one. And this is where the blockchain comes from, right? If you've heard about cryptocurrency and all this kind of stuff, this is what they mean by blockchain. It means that you cannot decrypt the last piece without having decrypted the first piece. You have to go all the way down the chain to figure out the pieces as they go in so that you have to, you can tell if any of the data has been, um, been compromised. Because if it's been compromised, it's not going to come out the same at the end. And so this is what good entropy looks like. So this is AES CBC um, using the cipher block chain that we just saw there. And you can't tell that that was a picture at all. And that's what you want. This is what you're trying to get. You're trying to get something that doesn't represent your, your previous data whatsoever. This is hard to crack. And I kind of went over a little bit, but there's a big difference between localized and global entropy. So when you have a random, uh, when you're doing your blockchaining, right, you're creating local entropy on that piece of data. So each block inside of your data, even if you have the same value, right, if you encrypt A, five letters of it, five letter A's, it's not going to be the same value each time. But it's also important throughout your data that you're going to have global entropy. So your entire data set uh, is, has better entropy because if you encrypt five, uh, five A's and you have it in, in there 100 times, it's different every time. So that you can't just determine, oh, these are all the same. I'm going to go find the, you know, if I'm going to hack into your database and I want a, a particular date of birth, I can find, oh, well, if I crack this one, I now have 1,000 dates of birth instead of uh, maybe this other one that only has 20. So it makes it a, an easier attack vector. So this way, if they want to decrypt and try and hack your data, they have to do it one at a time. Same thing with passwords. Because passwords exist across your data. No matter what your data is, there's going to be passwords. Even if it's going to be, oh, well, most of our user IDs start with, you know, uh, if you've got a, an ID that's a numeric value, you may have most of them, at least a 1,000 of them, start with this number, right? Um, so you don't want that always to be the same if you're encrypting those things, because you don't want to aid your adversaries. You don't want to make it easy on them. So there's different cryptographic types. Uh, the two we'll discuss here are symmetric key cryptography, which is shared secrets, and asymmetric key cryptography, which is public-private key pairs. Uh, you probably use both of these, um, and you definitely use it every day and may not know it. Um, and each one of them has a different trust level. If you're going to share keys with someone, you've got to trust that they can keep that key safe. Because if they can't, then your whole scheme is now broken. So if you're sharing with other parties, you may want to consider using asymmetric key cryptography where they don't have all of the data. It's a little more complicated, a little more work, but you don't have to worry about if they get compromised, you're compromised. So, and the applications we're going to talk about with cryptography is encryption, digital signatures, and key derivation. And when you see key derivation, think password hashing. It's not actually password hashing. And if you're hashing, you're doing something wrong, and we'll talk about that. Um, so encryption is protecting the data that needs to be recalled, because it can be reversed via decryption. Uh, key derivation and sign digital signatures cannot be reversed. They can just be recreated. Digital signatures are used to verify the data, authenticity of the data. Sometimes a digital signature is not more than a hash, although those aren't terribly secure. If you've done a download before, you've seen the, you know, the SHA hash and the MD5 hash and all that type of stuff. Um, that's to verify that the data is accurate, although you have to assume that if they've hacked that, they probably hacked the hash too. Um, but in this particular situation, it's signing data using secrets so that you can determine the authenticity of the data. Uh, it's used mostly in data transfer. So when you receive data from someone, you want to make sure it hasn't been tampered with along the way through man-in-the-middle attack. Uh, you want to make sure that data is accurate. And like I said, it cannot be reversed, but can be reproduced for, uh, for verification. And there's key derivation. So key derivation is what we call password hashing. Uh, it cannot be reversed, and it's computationally expensive by design. And this is the important part. The important part of password hashing is computationally expensive by design. If you're doing standard hashing, um, it's not expensive, right? To do an MD5 takes almost no time. Um, and we'll kind of go through a little bit of that in a minute. So 
Symmetric key cryptography uses, again, shared secrets, cipher algorithms against blocks or streams of data. You're probably using blocks, unless you're doing video streaming or audio streaming or something like that. Um, most people are doing block, you're moving blocks of data, uh, and that's gonna be good enough, so we'll, we'll talk about blocks. Um, do not use electronic cookbook, it's still in there. <laughs> it's still everywhere, available as an option for backwards compatibility, do not use it. Right, when you saw the tux in there, that was ECB, that's electronic cookbook. It does not use a cipher feedback mode. Cipher block chaining will be the right, chase, uh, right choice for most implementations, so use CBC when you get the options for, uh, for your block mode. Cipher block chaining is important because the entire message is required for decryption. A full cipher text block is used for the seed for the next block, as, we showed in the, as I showed in the example. And uh, here it is again. So there's your cipher blockchain. So again, you're taking one beat, when you're taking the encrypted part of one piece of data, putting in the next one and using that for encryption. Super, super safe. And for, asymm or for symmetric keys, you're creating an HMAC, which is a hash-based message authentication code. And it's combining it with a key. So you're taking uh, your key and your data, making a hash, uh, and it's doing uh, some other computations in it to make it more difficult to recreate, uh, depending on which HMAC you're using. Uh, SHA-256, there's this whole idea of collisions. What you don't want is you don't want two pieces of data being able to have the same signature. So you want to have a hashing algorithm that has enough, that's large enough for your data set that you're not going to have collisions. SHA-256 is considered safe for most pieces of data. If you've got gigantic data, yeah, you're going to want to change that. Um, but SHA-256 is going to be a really good option for an HMAC. Asymmetric key cryptography. So RSA is common and available in Node. Uh, it uses very large prime integers. It's very computationally expensive. Um, and it uses key pairs to protect secrets. So in order for us to move encrypted data back and forth, I have a set of keys, you have a set of keys. I encrypt it with my set, give it to you. You encrypt with your set, give it to me. Um, and you've got a private key to public key. So private key is secret. You don't give it to anyone, ever, 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 ever. Right? Private keys are what you use to make your, uh, your TLS certs. Never give anybody that key, because once you've done, they have the keys to your kingdom. But they can do encryption, decryption, signatures, and signature verification. So if you're doing it yourself, if you're just storing the data yourself, you can just use the, uh, the private key. But the public key, the key that you give out to anyone who needs to be able to encrypt data to send to you or to verify a signature of your data, that's what you give out because it can only encrypt and verify signatures. It does not have enough data to do the reverse. Key size and hash algorithms are very important for this. The minimum recommended key size is 2048. It's too easy to crack 1024. Um, if you've used a browser, right, Google has said we will, anyone who has a, a key size smaller than 2048, we're gonna tell you that it's not secure. So a lot of you that have websites have had to upgrade, and this is why. And you want the same thing when you're doing your, um, your local data. Uh, so SHA-1 is considered safe because of the way that it does its, its signatures. It's considered safe, but I'm always gonna say use SHA-256. Um, you're always better to be higher, so SHA-256 SHA is gonna be better, and it's available, you may as well use it. RSA has data limitations, so it can only encrypt or sign up to the length of the key size which is problematic, right? If you have a 2048 key, you can only do 2K of data. Most transactions, that's fine. Some transactions, it may not, um, which is why it's often mixed with symmetric key cryptography. So if you've used Jose or anything like that using a, a JSON a web encryption, you're, you can use it to actually use the RSA to uh, encrypt the keys that you use for actually using uh, symmetric encryption. So you create random keys and IVs, Encrypt your data using that, using AES, which is very fast, and uses large amounts of data, and then you encrypt the key and the IV using your RSA and send it that way. So that you have a different key and IV every time, which adds uh, extra security. And signatures use hashing. So if your signature, uh, if the data that you're signing is larger than the key size, it's gonna hash it uh, so that it can actually fit it. Padding in RSA is how it creates entropy. So it's important to use a good padding scheme. Usually a padding scheme doesn't matter, you just use it for making sure that everybody else understands what your padding scheme is, uh, and then it's used by someone else, and you can tell them what it is. But for RSA, it's crucial. 
PKCS1 padding is not safe. Do not use it. Use OAAP, which is defined in the crypto library as P RSA PKCS1 OAAP padding. Make sure you're using OAAP padding. Otherwise, it is not safe. It's key derivation functions. Like we said, uh, like, uh, like never use MD5 or SHA for a password. It's super common to find this, especially in, in legacy code, that you're using some sort of hashing algorithm to do passwords because 10 years ago it was considered safe because 10 years ago you didn't have 1,000 GPUs inside of a board that you could just go crack passwords all day. Uh, today that is the case. Only use key derivation functions. Injects the salt for entropy. Make sure your salt is random. Uh, and it does iterations. It just does more and more hashing iterations to increase cost. The idea of password hashing through key derivation is to make it expensive. It's not that it can't be duplicated, it just has to be very expensive to do so. And if you use the right algorithms, people who try and hack your site will try and get the most recent passwords, the top 100 passwords, and then they'll just stop. So users that are trying to be security conscious will be safe enough for you to find out that you've been breached and give them the alert to change their password. That's all you're trying to do is buy time. So bigger is better. <laughs> So the more time it takes, the safer your users are, the more time you have to let your users know that you had a, a breach, and that they need to go change their passwords if they have that password for that site and for any site that they've used that password on elsewhere. Now, if you're wondering what key duration function to use, so Argon2i is the new hotness. It won the, the nice password hashing competition. Uh, there's some questions because it's only been around for a couple years that it hasn't really been proven, tried and true. But if you want the best password hashing on the planet, you want Argon2i. Uh, Scrypt has been around for quite some time, and it does not have a maximum password length, and it uh, does time-based, so you're going to be able to uh, get the same kind of uh, values that you're going to get, the higher values that you want based on time. Uh, Bcrypt is acceptable, uh, but don't use PD PBKDF2. If you have to, if you have no options for installing anything on your server, um, you can use PBKDF2, it comes built in, but it's not super, super secure, and it's not really forward, uh, it's not forward safe. All of these other things, Bcrypt, Scrypt, and Argon2i are storing the hashing information inside of the hash, so you know what was used, so you know how many iterations they were, so if you want to increase that at some time, you can do that. Um, so they're, they're a much better option if you'd be able to uh, just give it a password and figure it out. You don't have to remember how many iterations and that type of stuff. You only have to know the number of iterations when you create the password. But no passwords are best, so if you have an option to not store passwords, I would suggest don't, all right? <laughs> the less information that you have for attackers to get, the less likely you are to be attacked. I have recommendations. So use RSA asymmetric key cryptography when transferring data. If you're moving it back and forth, you don't wanna trust other people with your sensitive information with keys, uh, and you don't want to have the keys to someone else's kingdom. You don't want to have the secret of someone else who accesses their data on your system if you don't have to. Uh, mix AES with random keys and IVs per transfer. So if you're, so you can encrypt with REA using AES and random keys and IVs, they can crack it once, but probably not again. Um, always use crypto random bytes for randomness. Do not use anything else for generating random values. It is not cryptographically secure. Uh, and use bcrypt, scrypt, or argon2i for passwords. Always, always, always. Strengths. AES, 256, CBC is the minimum. Use that. Uh, and for the, the HMAC, use a SHA-256. RSA, 2048 plus. If you, can, if you can do 4096 and you can manage it and handle it on your servers and the load, do it. The higher the better, the safer that you are, the more future-proof that you are, because one day, 2048, they're gonna come out and say, yep, it's not secure anymore. Um, it's the minimum now. Remember, 2048 is the minimum. Uh, make sure that you're using OAEP. Uh, always OAEP. Um, and the RSA SHA-256 signature. And when you're hashing, hash until it hurts. Okay? Most people are only logging in once. It may take half a second. You're going to have to spawn a thread to do it. It's going to be okay. Right? You want to spend half a second. Your user's not going to complain about half a second, but it's going to make their data secure. So further reading, um, there is a lot of information on the Node.js crypto as far as go to the very bottom for the things not to do, I would suggest. Wikipedia is where you get most of this information. Uh, and then the packages for Bcrypt, Scrypt, and Argon. Uh, please, please, please provide feedback. Um, 
speaker rate. I mean, super awesome. The slides are up there as well. And I probably should have gotten the short link. I'm not quite sure why I didn't. Um, and that's it. Any questions? Quickly. <laughs> so, for example, keyboard def uh, key, uh, password key definition. I really don't like ever saying the password over the line. And right. So, do you? I'm looking for good JavaScript libraries that can run in the browser and run in Node. And so, in particular, I'm willing to accept just the keyboard, the password derivation function. But I'd actually like all of the basic algorithms that swing both ways. Do you have preferred JavaScript-only libraries that can let me follow your recommendations? So first of all, never send a hashed password over the wire, um, because they now have the actual value shipped over the wire. Right? Um, if they steal the password, they steal the password, you've got other problems. Um, there's ways that you can resolve that via um, SSL pinning and things like that to trust that the connection is secure. But you never want to hash it and send it. If you encrypt it, they've got to have the information to encrypt it, so it's not really helping much. Because the keys of the kingdom have to be on the client side anyway, so they're going to provide it. So there's, I mean, there's not a great way to go about that um, on that particular matter. I'll beg to differ, but this is not the venue for right. it. So the real I mean, question is the JavaScript file. library question is the one I really want answered. I don't, I don't suggest using any JavaScript library to do this outside of the core stuff, because the core stuff has problems and gets fixed on a patch on a regular basis, and the JavaScript ones are always lagging behind. Uh, I think they're a great exercise, and you might want to use it if you have to, but I would say use the C libraries that are doing it, because those are the ones that are being maintained by cryptographers. So I don't have any suggestions for any JavaScript libraries to do it. OK, thank you. Question? Yeah, just one comment. Um, uh, it's counterintuitive, but on 64-bit systems, uh, SHA-512 is actually faster than SHA-256. Uh, so people who have hitting performance considerations might want to keep that in mind. Awesome. Thank you. Anything else? Awesome. Oh, you got a question? Yeah. All right. Sorry. Uh, your recommended time cost for password uh, key derivation functions to have a Obviously, a secure hash on your password, but not inhibit the user experience. It all depends on like until it hurts, right? You've got to, you've got to have a user experience. It's not terrible. Mm -hmm. So if your user is willing to accept half a second when they log in, I mean, I would not freak out if it took a half a second to yeah. log in. Um, it's, it's all going to depend on your user, your case, what it's going to be, but and also the speed of your of what you're hosting, right? So I, mean, I would just say do as much as you can without killing your user experience, and, and try and figure out what that is. All right. Awesome. Well, thank you, everybody, and I appreciate the talk. Please, please, please um, give me some feedback, either off to the side or rate it up there, uh, and the slides will be there. Thank you very much.